outdoor swan think big. They always have. But even for one of the oldest and most successful high quality builders in the world, their latest launch takes even them into new territory. Three, two, foot flat out racing one design for owner drivers. Oh, and one that can be used for cruising too. No one has achieved this yet. So why does Swan believe they can? Part of the answer lies with the success they've already had in their Club Swan racing and the circuit that's proved so popular. Also, when the Club Swan 50 was launched, there were similar doubts as to whether a racing 50-footer with such extreme looks could work. But it did. Season after season, the class has had solid support and some great racing. The most recent example was in Valencia, where there were 16 on the entry list and were the biggest of the three classes. The Radical Club Swan 36 was another design to challenge conventional thinking. It too has proved popular. These are just a few examples in a stack of evidence that proves that when Swan think big, you need to take them seriously. So, since the Club Swan 80's announcement, there's been a great deal of anticipation around this design. And here it is, the Club Swan 80. What a beast. She was launched earlier in the summer in La Spezia, and after a little bit of cruising and a delivery trip to Sardinia, her first test would be at the Maxi Yacht Rolex Cup. And it was here that I was invited to step aboard to join the crew during their preparations. Just as with any new boat of this size, there was plenty to do to get her race ready. Even so, it didn't take long to realise that the Club Swan 180 stands out from the norm, if there is such a thing in the maxi world. There we are, a couple of minutes out of the harbour, main up, jib up. No one's broken out into a sweat yet because it was a push button exercise getting the sails up. And we came out into what looked like pretty light conditions. I mean, you can see from the water, there ain't much breeze out here, but here we are, doing just over eight knots upwind, keel fully canted, crew out on the rail, in no breeze at all. I think you get the message already. But perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised. A quick look at her stats provides a few clues, not least that she weighs just 19 tonnes. A point that I'd put to her designer earlier in the day. So it is a powerful boat, but, but yet light, and that is only achievable with a canting keel, you know. The, the beauty of the canting keel is that it allows you to uh, not have a very long draft. Um, there's a lot of boats that uh, achieve that by having lifting keels, but I am not a fan of that because um, to me the complexity, the hydraulic complexity of the uh, canting keel system is equal if not less than a lifting system. So if you're going to spend weight, complexity and money to a certain extent to a system that does something, I'd rather spend it on something that makes you quicker when you're sailing, not something that you use just to get in a harbour. This boat also has a canard, a single foil ahead of the keel that can be raised and lowered as well as rotated. What was the thinking behind this? Originally, the first, uh, the first version of the project had a sea foil, just like the, the, the Swan 36, which was very efficient in many uh, conditions, particularly reaching. Um, downwind, uh, they were kind of equal because uh, downwind you remove the sea foil and uh, you kind of remove the canard. So downwind is, is very much the same. Now, when it comes to upwind, the performances were very similar. Um, but the, in the simulations of the regattas, the canard, because of the tacking ability, uh, had a little ledge on the tacking ability. I, w I, was, I was still um, sort of 
confident and comfortable with the sea foil because because the differences upwind were very small, if nothing, uh, but yet you had a big advantage in the reaching. Uh, but since this project was very focused on the upwind performance and this kind of sailing, I think the canard was a good choice. Well, what we thought was going to be a light and tricky day has already turned into quite a glamour day out and we've only been out for about 40 minutes. We sailed upwind for about uh, 25 minutes. The breeze gradually increased to about 10 knots we had full cant on the keel, fully hiked, and we were going upwind at about 11 knots. We're now heading downwind with the A2. We rounded a set of rocks for a practice bear away and a hoist. And we're now slicing off downhill at 15, 16 knots. And uh, if you don't believe me, just have a look at this wake. That's not bad for 10 knots of breeze, is it? But there are lots of things that are noticeable about this boat already, apart from the sheer power in the rig. But to be honest, that's what you'd expect from an 80-footer, from a maxi. But one of the other things that you notice is that there are no grinding pedestals and no top handles. It's pretty much all push button. You'll see as we go through this jibe. to handle in sight. It hadn't taken long to discover that the 80 was a slippery boat. But what I was still wondering was why the company had set out to create a one design rather than simply a flat out maxi. I think uh, uh, having a one design in the maxi world uh, would really give a, a new dimension of fun. Uh, hopefully gentlemen like them competition like we have done in the other classes, uh, but so much rationality uh, that you get uh, to the excitement of uh, real racing, but also by so many reduction of uh, unneeded costs uh, that go into uh, trying to perform. Uh, and uh, the one lovely thing that I have always admired in sailing is the human factor, and the one design is uh, the kind of racing that uh, emphasizes uh, the human factor more than anyone else. In other words, pitting crew against crew and removing any hint of a home advantage with a faster boat. At this end of the market, that's bold. But for the crew aboard my song, for the moment at least, there would be no other Swan 80s to race against in the Maxi Yacht Rolex Cup. Their focus was making her as quick as possible before meeting the competition. So after our first session of Windward Lured trials, we then stopped for a little while just to move the mast. They're actually putting the shims in a slightly different position, reset up, and then we're back out testing again. We've just been upwind. The breeze has really stayed in really nicely all afternoon. It's been a good sort of steady 10 to 12 knots, which has been absolutely perfect. So now with the A3 set, we are sliding down wind, just looking at uh, 14 knots in, the 12 to 13 knots of breeze. The A3 is sort of more jib than uh, Jenica, and in itself, it actually provides yet another clue as to what this boat's about, and actually where the current state of play is, because at the end of the day, it's all about apparent wind sailing. We're going downwind at 140 degrees true, with something that looks remarkably like a jib set at the front. Owner Pierre Luigi Loro Piana was instrumental in the creation of the Club Swan 80. So, with four days at the helm, what were his initial thoughts and what are his plans for my song in the future? It's a little bit more complicated than to have a fixed kill. The canting kill gives you a, a lot of opportunities, but you need to know how to use it. So it's a, this movable uh, uh, writing moment, it, it's absolutely interesting. I like it very much. I think this kind of race is the race which this boat has been engineered 
but we can do also uh, long range uh, offshore races. We can do many of them. So I am I am uh, planning to do four to maximum five races a year in in, in the summertime in in the med. Then if once we go to the Caribbean, we will do three more. But uh, so far, I think it would be a good uh, a good exercise, and I think I will be very happy to do three four. Uh, uh, races, because this boat can be used also for uh, day sailing uh, by a family with a very limited crew, and so uh, I am sure we are going to enjoy sailing all the seas and not only the four race. Well, back at the dock, it was a long day out on the water, but what a fascinating day it was. So let me show you a few things that I think characterise why this boat is subtly so different. Vang strut, kicker, nothing surprising in that particularly, except that's not what it is. That carbon strut there is simply there to hold the boom up when the boat's at rest. This is the Vang, or the kicker, it's just a line of spectra. But what's interesting about this is it's not adjustable. This is a strop, and this is just a safety strop. It has no adjustment in it. This boat does not have an adjustable kicker. Why? Because the apparent wind is never back after the beam. There is no need to have a kicker at all, which is an interesting telltale sign of how this boat sails. Because when we were reaching off today and we were sailing at something like 70 degrees true, the apparent wind angle was 30 degrees and we were doing 12 or 13 knots in just 10, uh, 9 or 10 knots of breeze. That's almost in multi-hull territory. This is an apparent wind machine. Now, what else is particularly interesting? Well, <laughs> actually, on deck, the absence of any ropes or control lines and the rest of it, it's a very clean, uncluttered look. Now, one of the reasons why, in fact, the main reason why the cockpit feels so uncluttered and free from pedestals and the rest of it is because pedestals and winch handles have all been replaced by these button controls for the hydraulics on board that control all the winches, they control the jib tack, they control pretty much everything. There's all those ones down there, jib tack, in and out, jib up and down, out and in, it's all down there. Then a control here for the opposite winch, so you can actually drive the opposite winch from up here. And then over here, the traveller. There's not even a traveller control line between the helmsman's feet that you can flick on off. No, it's all buttons. So you may be asking yourself, why do you even need 16 people? Well, actually, to go cruising, you don't. The whole idea is that this boat can be sailed with four people. But when you come to turn a corner in race mode, the sails still weigh the same when you need to hump them up and down. And when it comes to controlling the boat, it's not just about your fingers, it's actually about your toes as well, because it's still got the push button controls for your feet. It's amazing isn't it? A maxi that's all controlled with fingers and toes. Here's another example of what I think characterises a boat that is on the face of it very simple but actually behind the scenes quite technical and surprisingly complex. It's the controls for the canting keel and for the dagger board and we've got a simple control panel here where you just got port or starboard and then centre button to just centre the keel back down. Very straightforward, very easy to see and understand. On the right hand side of this panel we've got board up, board down and then we've got board, um, uh, port and starboard to allow for the, you can alter the angle of the canard and then we've got the lift up and down for the canard. So on the face of it, very simple, very straightforward controls but it's the combination and the iterations between the amount of angle that you put on the canard and the amount of angle you put on the canting keel and what heel you want to, the optimum heel that you want to sail the boat at, that's the finesse, that's the detail. And I suppose in a way it's just as well that the controls are pretty straightforward because the way in which you use them isn't necessarily that easy to grasp straight away. Okay, so it's an 80 foot race boat, so you know what you're going to find down below, don't you? I bet you don't. Have a look at this. The first thing is, <laughs> well it's black, of course it is. 
It's carbon, but it's beautifully built, I have to say. I mean, the first thing that struck me about the construction, in a rather nerdy way, is just the quality of this untreated carbon all the way around throughout the boat. But that's not the main thing. This is a boat that, whether you believe it or not, has actually been designed with cruising in mind and with an interior that can have modules that can be changed to make more of a cruising boat. I don't think it's ever going to be a super yacht type interior, but looking at some of the images of what it could look like, it really is quite striking. And you can see the basis of it here. But let's have a little quick tour around. Let's start by going forwards. There's so much space around here. I'm, on these kind of boats, I'm used to crawling through tiny little bulkheads and little holes, but look at this space up here in this. This is obviously in race mode. This is sail storage and, well, actually not an awful lot of stuff goes up here because it's forward in the boat, so the weight will all be pushed down further aft. But when it's configured for cruising mode, this is the owner's forward cabin. And what a massive space this is. It has a module that goes in here that converts it into, into, a, uh, into the owner's cabin. But what a place. Up here, you'll see where the light is streaming in. This is actually the spinnaker chute. And uh, when we were out yesterday in training mode, uh, race training mode, this actually has a chute. You can just see over there on the left, actually, that's the module that goes in there. There's a great big um, canvas sock, a sailcloth sock, that zips onto there and goes right the way down through the back of the boat, just like a, conven a conventional dinghy spinnaker chute. Big roller here for uh, when the chute comes down. So. That's this area, and then around here, we come around the corner, we have the heads in here. Pretty stylish for racing heads. Carbon fiber, beautifully done. And then you can see, just we'll actually have a look at it on, on the other side, but if you come around this way here, this box here, with an awful lot of hydraulic piping, if uh, you come around to where I am and, and have a look that way, the hydraulic piping and controls. This is the canard, so the vertical board, the vertical dagger board that goes up and down. But it's quite a complex because it actually angles. So you can change the angle of attack going forwards and it's plus or minus eight degrees, which gives it its ability to lift the boat and reduce the leeway. But that's the sophistication of the technology that's required to achieve that in there. So that's an interesting detail. And then just around here, we can see just down in the floor is the canteen keel and what they call the wet box where you've got the head of the keel and then the two hydraulic rams that connect onto the keel that operate the canteen system. Over on this side, this is uh, the galley area which is another, apparently a module that comes in or out. And then on the other side behind where the camera is, if uh, Rita will just rotate and show you, is the other side of the galley over there. All very interesting. One of the other things that uh, you don't, I mean, whilst it's quite common to see exposed carbon fibre in the, in the inside of a race boat, you don't often find mahogany veneer. But, and there's not much of it, and it's just thin little panels and some very discreet lighting. And then as we go further aft, the boat can be configured with two cabins, uh, one either side, basically of the companionway area here, and then with their own heads. And they each have an individual heads. And we've got a heads just in there, which is very similar in style to the one up forwards. And then as we come back, these are, these are the berths where you'd actually have proper cushions up here for these berths either side. And then we get more into sort of racing territory where we're crawling through holes. But Come back here with me. Come and have a look down the back. So this is more like you'd expect, I guess, on a race boat. No standing headroom and uh, exposed uh, engineering. And it's the nav station area is back here. There's a hatch that goes up to the cockpits. The navigator can poke their head up and down. A little bit like a Volvo 65, I guess. Actually, it was quite comfortable compared to a Volvo 65. And then further back, we've got a um, sealed area, and you can just see the mechanism there for the, for the twin rudders. But 
quite a straightforward setup. And again, the thing that really strikes you down here is just the quality of finish. The quality of finish throughout all of this exposed, untreated carbon fibre. It's very impressive. Striking a balance between a full-on race boat and one that will look appealing below decks when she's off duty is clearly a big challenge. So what was the starting point for the interior design team? The point we positioned on our design was much closer to the performances rather than to the comfort uh, driven uh, aspect. Uh, so here the, the point was uh, designing around the structures, the existing structures, the given hull shape with the very poor uh, flexibility in terms of adjustments of uh, constraints, of movement of bulkheads, movement of structures. Uh, so we worked on making the structures part of the interiors, uh, high lighting and underlining their presence or uh, or hiding their presence somehow um, so that was interesting indeed uh, as well as the use of materials which was uh, um, really something we focused on so basically at the end we ended up with with a very simple solution uh, thanks also to the quality of the construction of the carbon construction uh, provided by Persico which was uh, basically leaving the carbon visible uh, and adding uh, light touches of uh, wood veneer, so very thin veneer, uh, mahogany, creating a very nice contrast and uh, palette. What a boat, what a machine. But interestingly, not because it breaks any new ground in a specific area, it's impressive because of the way that it combines a number of existing technologies and subtly refines them to create a machine that is really very impressive, particularly in light winds. But talk is cheap. Her performance on the race course would be what really mattered. So here she is, and she's right up at the front of the fleet. There's quite a long beat coming up here, and she's 20 foot shorter than some of the big, big maxis. So she was bound to lose out. But I must say, this is her first race. And I think she's proving to be a bit of a rocket ship, and the crew are gonna be absolutely delighted with this performance. We don't know how it's going to shape on, up on handicap just yet, but to be right up here running with the big dogs, they're going to be chuffed to nuts. To be in the hunt after literally five days of sailing total is, uh, is a dream come true. And you can tell things are good on board when there's pure silence and everybody's just watching us sail by boats. I mean, literally sail by boats. And we weren't expecting that. Nobody was expecting Maybe Juan was expecting that. Juan expects everything. Um, in, all, in, all, in a good way, by the way. Like, this thing's for real downwind. It, it really is. It's something else. I'm sure every other boat we sailed against in the fleet is going, you got to be kidding me. That thing is brilliant downwind. Now we got to, listen, we, we left five good minutes on the race course because of the new boat kinks and everything else. But all in all, let's say be on the podium against this fleet on day number one you know i'm not a religious man but <laughs> you are now i am now absolutely by the end of the week a scoreline that began with a third and ended with a win was not only impressive but was immensely satisfying for everyone involved with the project creating a new maxi will always be a big challenge but the target for swan was even higher it is an ambitious goal to create an 80 foot one design but this is one hell of a way to do it.